Good evening, and welcome to the December 18th, 2017 meeting of the Merrimack School Board. If you could please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We are on to item number two, which is public participation. There are three people in the room, and I'm not sure if anyone wants to participate. So seeing them, we will close public participation. We're going to skip item number three for materials that are uh, forthcoming. And item number four is the formal hearing on food service budget for 2018-2019. And I welcome to the table Director Dave Zeke. Welcome back. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, I'd like to uh, present the food service budget proposal for the uh, school district six schools for the 2018-19 school year. Um, a couple of the things that we have on the uh, uh, replacement for equipment this year would be a couple of display cases at the high school for hot foods and a stainless steel work table um, for food preparation at the Master Cola upper, upper Elementary School. Um, these pieces of equipment have been in service for um, over 23, 24, 25 years and um, are in need of replacement at this time. Um, <clears throat> just a, an update with the, uh, the lunch program as far as um, being a member of the buying group. Um, the buying group has um, expanded a little bit. It's now um, 50 school districts in the in the New Hampshire state of New Hampshire, and uh, it does help considerable with buying power um, for all the districts concerned. Um, we will continue with that as well. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> as far as um, repairs, food ser food service repairs, um, we have increased our proposed budget a little bit this year um, only because we have had some um, items that were in need of repair last year um, which elevated that expense um, as far as the, the vehicle repairs um, we're leaving that level funded at three hundred dollars um, for the next year laundry services um, is pretty much the same as last year and the same as food food service travel both about the same. Um, as far as supplies and the uh, food food budgets, um, supplies we have remained level funded in the actually the proposed food budget. Um, we have dropped it a little bit this year, um, only to bring it down to a, a somewhat normal level that we are at at this point. Um, as far as the vehicle and gas and oil that. Um, We'll leave that at the same fund as last time. And <clears throat> this year with, with the uh, food service technology service contracts, um, we are at 12500 which has been the same for a couple of years now. Um, as far as the replacement equipment I talked ab briefly about was the, um, the stainless steel table at Master Cola Elementary, Upper Elementary rather, and a couple of hot disp uh, display cases at the high school. Um, the high school dis display cases we use in the morning for a snack bar and and the, uh, the sandwich room. Um, they've been in place for a couple, you know, for a couple decades, and uh, um, unfortunately, sometimes it's hard to get replacement parts for those things. So um, I think it's best that we replace those um, just for the uh, consistency of the. The temperatures for the food that we put there, and uh, and for the appearance actually is, is much better. Um, and the table at the upper Andy, I think just curiosity. I, I mean, mm -hmm. I haven't had a kid to high school for a while. <clears throat> yes. So what what is when you say display cases? It has like a glass front that they can pick and choose what they want, or <clears throat> it's um well it, it it's actually more functional than display. It's a display so they can see what they have. Um, the person in the back will be the one taking things out. Um, 
but it's more for consistency of the temperatures that were, were in there. Um, right now we have a couple pieces in place, but um, the uh, temperature is not as um, constant as it should be. Um, and with this, with this case, it would be enclosed and keep the heat in there better. So it's really a, a serving location that happens to have visibility that you can see what's inside to choose from and stuff. Right. Okay. Yeah. Display yeah. cases. Oh, no, it's not like a it, 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 I just want case. a clarification on what it yeah, was. That's yeah. all. Thanks. <laughs> and the table at the upper elementary has been uh, it's been in service longer than I've been in, in the district. Um, um, you know, basically, it's it, the the supports have been you know moved around enough that it's become unstable, and it's um, something that we need to we need to replace. After 20 <clears throat> plus, plus years per unit, I don't think you're asking a whole lot of us, so <laughs> definitely. Um, and the last thing for improvement development, um, the the proposed budget hasn't changed at all. The expended amount was a little uh, confusing because we had a, a guest speaker in here and probably should have been put into a different category, but um, that's why the expense is, is high on that one. Okay. Um, but other than that, I think... I think that's it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, the, yeah, I did present one question oh, in sorry. advance. That's yep. all right. That's fine. Um, um, yep. Go ahead. Go ahead. I can read it as well. Yep. Um, so, based on the budget investments for replacement equipment that was in place for 20 plus years, what other food service equipment is over 20 years old and more of the life expectancies of uh, this equipment, thinking the way we do on roof replacement projects? Sure. Um, well, in the high school, um, of course, we have certain things that have been there since they built the, the building. Um, the uh, walk-in cooler, for instance, um, ovens, the serving tables that the food is, is put on um, are all still in place. Um, and, you know, be, be honest with you, those things are still operating excellent. So um, in the upper elementary, again, the same thing with the walk-in coolers um, and the ovens. Basically, the, those are the pieces that are still in place. Um, it's hard to say that we want to put them on a rotation because um, some of those things do fall under the maintenance. So the boxes, the freezer boxes, and the coolers could last for you know 20 more years if they're if they're serviced properly. Um, some of the things that may be necessary to replace would be the compressor and things like that, which are smaller amounts of money. So um, that would be in the maintenance budget of uh, equipment. As far as replacement of those pieces, I think it's only on uh, on a basis that is a necessity, such as when we replaced the high school freezer box, um, only because it was not it was not holding the the, the temperatures correctly, um, and that's something that and I can't predict when when that's going to happen. So, as far as projections go, and if they're over 20 years, I think um, it's an it's a piece by piece uh, replacement. Right, and I think something you mentioned earlier as well is th that things, especially older models, um, and say a couple of years ago as well, that the new models are designed to help maintain consistent temperatures, and, right. and I know that the standards are much more stringent than they were when right. we purchased the last round, obviously. Yeah. So um, what are you seeing as, you know, what you would call future? Is this, our, well, you know, I think we want to just kind of set an expectation that we'll probably be looking at a couple units a year that are going to have to be replaced. and. Yeah about these amounts, you know, with give and take for inflation would be something that should, we should be looking at on a fairly regular basis for the next few years because you have some aging equipment? Um, and again, it could be next couple of years, it could be a little bit longer. It depends on, you know, like I said, some of the boxes that we have, the, the coolers are well constructed, so they, they may be in place for a number of years, um, what you would consider a normal, normal expectancy. Um, and some of the equipment, like the ovens at the high school, I think those ovens were probably better made than the ovens that we have at the middle school. So um, I we guess may you be have looking a lot of our places these days. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So it's hard for me to say exactly how long it would it would be for replacement, but um, that's why I think we look at it every year okay. and try to project what we what we want to replace. Thank Perfect. you, though. Okay. Other questions from the board? Andy. But just to remind us is that all these expenditures that you're doing come out of what you make in your budget and things like that. This is not Correct. something that we, we would budget for like we would repairing a, 
a furnace at the high school or something like that. This is something that's within your it's it, it's within sphere of respending money, right? Yes. Right. Self-funding department. Self-funding yes. department. Right. Correct. Right. But in the same token, it also could impact the rate that we charge students. So those are things we want to keep mindful as that as we're. Mm, I don't think that would that would impact the rate that we charge students. I think that you know that not at the levels that you're our, talking here. If you had right. to replace a hundred thousand dollar right walk in something or other, that's a different story. But. Yeah. Which is why I was actually asking that question. Yeah. Now, we're looking at some big tickets that could actually affect something like the cost of a lunch. No. So excellent. Well, this is. Very encouraging, Dave. Thank you. Now, you kind of set the standard for all the department heads to come before us for the next few <laughs> weeks. So, you know. Well, they'll, they'll follow up. Absolutely. With, with so, you just, you just set the bar high, Dave. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Any other questions of the board? Seeing none, food service hearing is closed. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Drive safely on the way home. Absolutely. So, yep, we're going to go backwards. So we're going to mix it up a bit. So we're going back to item number three, which is the 2017 Youth Risk Behavior Survey results. And I invite to the table Betsy Hood. And I will uh, let Mark, um, who is the chair of our Merrimack Safeguard Committee, um, kind of lay the foundation of the presentation. Well, <clears throat> thank you. First of all, I want it known that Mrs. Hood um, provided these uh, to me well in advance of the meeting and I simply forgot to bring them tonight so thank you Mrs. Hood for doing that and I apologize for <laughs> making you have to wait. Um, well I think I just want to say you know Betsy Hood has been a tremendous uh, uh, advocate for youth in our district for many years and certainly as relates to um, to um, Merrimack Safeguard in particular and the Youth Risk Behavior Survey certainly has impacted Merrimack Safeguard but um, this is a, 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 a survey that really helps us to draw a picture about our community, um, just even outside of our schools, just our community. And so we've uh, used it for many important, um, much important guidance over the years. And so I'm really happy that, um, once again, Betsy can help uh, clarify uh, its content. So thanks for being here. Yes, okay, thank you very much. Okay, so as Mark said, I'm Betsy Hood. I'm actually the Executive Director of the Youth Council, but I am here in my capacity as the Project Director of Merrimack Safeguard. Um, this data was just released a couple of weeks ago and was actually based on the survey that students took back in the spring um, of 2017. So 943 students at the high school uh, between 9 and 12th grade took the survey, which reflected about 80% of the total population. I thought the most interesting thing to do would be to present you with the full 10 years worth of data because this was actually the sixth time that students had taken the survey and there's about a hundred questions all together um, but I pulled out some really key things that I thought would be really helpful for the school board and the community to know. Um, a lot of the data looks really good. Um, this was the first time ever doing a presentation like this that I actually added trend lines because I thought that might be really helpful to get an overall look. Um, so the first graph that you're looking at are the ninth graders that reported their first drink before they were age 13. I pulled out ninth grade specifically thinking that those kids would be the most accurate reporters um, of when they might have had a first drink, whereas I think the older students get, they may not remember quite as clearly. Um, and you can see that that has gone down um, significantly from 2007 to 17. Um, and looking at the 30-day alcohol use for all of the grades combined in the second chart um, has also gone down significantly from when the survey was first done in 2007 to 2017. Um, going forward then, what I did is break out by grade um, in the larger chart between 2007 and 17 and thought probably the easiest way, because this is a lot of information, would be to just put the data from 2007 and 17 so you can see how the numbers dropped. For example, in 2007, 32% of ninth graders had had a drink within 30 days prior to taking the survey. That number's dropped to 12.7%. That's very significant um, in terms of the risky behaviors that kids are getting involved with. Um, all of those kids have experienced Detective Prentice in the middle school for those who went to school in Merrimack. Um, and so for each grade level, um, the drop has been significant. Again, back in 2007, over half of the students um, had had a drink of alcohol within 30 days prior, and that number is down to 37.8%. So there's 
all of the raw data that the school district has, so you're more than welcome to go through the entire report, but it's really complex. It's over 100 pages um, with all kinds of graphs and charts, so just tried to pull out some of the most critical information. Um, one of the points I put in here that I thought was really significant is there's actually been an increase in the number of students who are given alcohol by other people. Um, this was a number that we shared a couple years ago and said this was a, a really important point for parents to really pay attention to. As much as we may be talking with our kids at home about how we don't want them to drink and expect them not to drink, other people are giving our kids alcohol. Um, parties, other places, you name it, um, but something that parents should pay attention to. Um, at the same time, youth are making better decisions um, and far fewer youth are riding in a vehicle with someone who has been drinking. So I think those messages have been loud and clear that it's not safe to drive with a driver who has been drinking. Um, at the text at the bottom of the page, though, you'll notice that in two 2017 alone, 50 students reported driving when they had been drinking alcohol within 30 days of having taken the survey. So that's 50 students. And then at the same time, 304 students reported that they texted or emailed while they were driving on one or more of the past 30 days prior to taking the survey. So I feel like there's still a lot more that parents and the community can really do for kids to help them uh, make healthier choices. So going to the, the second page or the back page, um, the next charts that I looked at were around marijuana use. Um, and remembering back to the front page when we looked at ninth graders reporting their first alcohol use, um, the blue column indicates the first marijuana use for kids before age 13 for ninth graders. And as I looked at that number and saw that it was almost pretty flat, I actually added the alcohol rate back in. And where you can see that kids are making much better choices around the risks of alcohol use, their marijuana use is, is pretty flat. We haven't seen the same drop that one would expect if that message was really getting across. Um, so I flag that to be a concern, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, if you then look at the next chart, once again, Merrimack students are making much better decisions. Um, although we never really had high rates of heroin or methamphetamine use to begin with, those rates are also down, um, as is ecstasy. And you can see that synthetic marijuana, that's K2 spice, things along those lines, when those first came out, um, a lot of kids were experimenting with those, you can see in 2013. Um, and that's also dropped significantly in 2017. Um, one of the concerns is that about a quarter of the kids, 281 youth, have used an electronic vapor product in the past 30 days. There's been a lot of new research coming, about, coming out about the dangers to that. I don't have all of that information with me, but I know that Nashua has been doing a lot of presentations to their students about popcorn lung and some other really significant health issues from vaping. Um, so that would be something to really take a look at because almost 36% of students at least once have used a vaping device as reported on the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. Um, but one of the things I wanted to point out that I feel is a, a significant concern is if you look at the 30-day marijuana use by grade, um, those numbers are actually going up in terms of the trend line. Um, again, looking at the responses in 2017 versus 2007, you can see that there are um, steps going up, which is really the opposite direction of what should be happening um, based on the harm of marijuana, the strength of what's available today um, is a concern. Um, there's also more we will talk about in a second around um, how that really does trigger uh, more depression among young people, um, which is noted later. Um, one of the other really positive things is looking at the 30-day prescription drug use by youth. Um, you'll notice that in 2009, um, among all ages, um, was much higher than it is today. Um, and as I was looking at that graph, I decided I would kind of flip it on its head, and the graph to the right is the exact same information, but instead of being sort of bundled by year along the um, horizontal axis, it's by grade. So you can see that the ninth graders are making much better decisions now, 10th, 11th, 12th, and so forth. But the trend lines show the trajectory as kids get older, the amount of use continues to jump. So the the level of increase between the grades has been consistent between 2009 and 2017. And 2009 was the first year that they started questioning students around prescription drug use. So the trajectory is still the same, but the level of risky use is lower than it was, if that makes sense. 
Um, and then the last section I wanted to talk about was on suicide and depression. Um, one of the things Merrimack Safeguard is really proud about is that the school district has really taken such an interest in developing a really great mental health committee that they have been just digging into all kinds of data and really taking a look at what are the needs of Merrimack students. And I feel like this chart here shows really the significant increases around students that reported feeling sad or hopeless for two weeks in a row. And the question that they respond to continues with, that I stop doing some of my usual activities. Um, so those are kids that are starting to back off, starting to isolate themselves a little more, and that has jumped up over six percentage points um, since 2007. The number of students who have seriously considered suicide has jumped up five percentage points over the last 10 years, and the students who have attempted suicide has also been on the increase. And um, I feel like it can't be overstated that that also would tie into some of the marijuana use, whether students are self-medicating because they're feeling depressed or they're becoming more depressed by the nature of their use. Like I worry that that's really a vicious cycle. And then when you look at the, the small text box on the right, um, over 75% of the kids didn't have eight hours of sleep at night. So then you're looking at kids that aren't getting good night sleeps, which that also leads to depression and I feel like just creates this um, circle of concern. 19% um, of students said they didn't feel like they mattered to the community. Um, that's actually a better number than in previous years. There was an iteration maybe four years ago that only about a third of the kids felt they mattered. So they now report the data in the opposite way and I didn't have a chance to kind of dig back and, and really try to understand where that's moved over time. Um, but 223 students feel like they don't matter. Um, 79 students slept away from home because they were kicked out, they ran away, or were abandoned. You know, these are high school students that our guidance counselors and social workers are dealing with on a regular basis. Um, and then 237 youth, which is just over 20%, reported that they were bullied electronically in the past year, and that's with social media and, um, and other forms of electronic bullying. So that's the quick snapshot. Um, this was just released, so we haven't even delved deeply into it with Merrimack Safeguard and really taking a look at what can the community do and what can we do for our final year action plan, um, but thought that it was important to share that with you today. I'm not sure I can answer any questions, but I can certainly try. Are there any questions, comments from the board? Michael? Um, uh, thank you very much for this information. My actual question is towards the administration. Um, is it in the policy for the school to is it called out uh, electronic cigarettes and vaping units? Is that actually called out today in our policy? Has that been updated for today's use of uh, products? Um, you're talking about electronic cigarettes? Uh, vaping systems, electronic. No, I think that probably needs to be reviewed. Yeah, maybe that should be on something that we should look at after the budget season to actually change. Because I've actually, I've been told of uh, eighth graders walking down the street actually using a vaping product, and I've actually seen, seen kids walking out of the high school using a vaping product, so I think it would be definitely something to. Oh, Marge, of course. Well, I just wanted to say, and that's why the tobacco survey that you just approved at the middle level is so important, because for the first time, vaping is in there. It has not been party to a, a specific tobacco survey that we've done before, so we thought that was terribly important to see what kids would say. Yeah. And then. The suicide obviously does raise some concern, um, and I don't want to minimize it at all, but I, I wonder if it's also because it's a little bit more open today that children and, and adults are talking a little bit more about it because it is such a, a, a challenge for many individuals. So I hope that it, it's alarming, but I hope that maybe the kids in, are able to talk about it a little bit more because of education that uh, your team and the school district is doing. Um, and hopefully we can get to those children soon. Well, I know one of the things I expressed, I think it may have been during the joint meeting, was just my fear that young people today are really struggling with how to have meaningful conversations. Um, I read an article not long ago that with the onset of an iPhone back in 2007 has been a significant increase in the number of young people that are depressed and suicidal. I think a lot of it looking like everyone else has a better life than them. I think more people are so connected to their devices that they don't even really know how to make eye contact or aren't even sure how to ask for help or if so, where to ask. So I feel like it's, it's really all tied in. Andy? 
So one of the things that struck out or stuck out, not struck, stuck out at me, was the one that talked about eight plus hours of sleep on a school night. Now, I, I know that when I was a kid, it was eight hours. You know, kids got eight hours of sleep. But in talking to other parents and looking at the norms of society, is eight hours of sleep really still a target that they measure for kids at school age, given all the stimulus and homework and everything else that goes through with the early starts of school? I'm personally not a healthcare professional, <laughs> but I, I have read several things that it's actually teenagers that need more sleep. No, no, I, I, even I don't think kids. that's changed, but I think the, the stereotypical norms of what occurs in the society today, the number of people, adults that get, I mean, the, the, I've read that the sleeping amount that adults get is less than it used to be because of stuff. And the question is, is it more appropriate, and, and when a survey like this comes out, that it not pick eight hours of sleep, but maybe pick seven or seven and a half? Just because. Well, this is a national evidence-based yeah. survey that the Center for Disease Control mm -hmm. did right. put out. So I guess I am believing that someone, some official who knows what they're talking about, determined that that's still really important. Well, Even if we've shifted as a society to get less sleep, that it's probably healthiest for our bodies to have a full eight hours of uninterrupted sleep. I'm just the, curious whether there's been any pushback on feedback. that just generally. Yep, so um, the nurses have actually, our nurses and the, and the, um, what, I'm forgetting now the name of their as national association, but let's call it the American Association of Nurses, I, I, or school nurses, but AASN, I think actually it is. Um, <clears throat> and they have actually addressed that by saying that um, regardless of, so I guess the, the sum is regardless of what um, the construct is now and the way people live lives, your body is your body. and and the eight hours for teens is still considered like an industry standard. <laughs> so um, th just based on the cognitive and physical needs, based on the changing body and so on, what they would say is eight hours is the baseline. And so um, whether that's the way we choose to live is a different thing from whether or not um, it's a medically sound decision to make. And so I think that's what the nurses would say is that that's a reasonable question to get data on. I guess maybe I'll flip my question around a little bit. Is I'm assuming it asks the question, do you get eight hours of sleep or not, sort of yes or no under that? Is that the way it's asked? I don't recall specifically. Because to me a more valuable measure would have been how many hours of sleep do you get a night to see if the trend has gone down because of stimulus and things like that. Just. You know, I, I understand what the standard are. Maybe that wasn't the right way to ask the question. The question is, are we finding that kids in general are getting less sleep now than they got 10 years ago? Because I know kids stay up longer reading their electronic devices and things like that mm -hmm. than they ever did before. A lot more distractions and things and waking up in the middle of the night and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. anyway. True. Cinda? Yeah, I was going to say, you know, I think there's probably a reason on how they ask the question. Like Betsy said, she doesn't recall exactly how it was spelled out, but you're talking about people that are distributing this across the country. So I'm sure it's, you know, well, with with a lot of experience and surveys and, and health and so on and so forth that I would have to kind of take how that question is asked and and think that that's probably the best at this time on how to ask those questions. Are there any other questions from the board? Seeing none, thank you very much. Um, and we, we look forward to uh, future data. You've been so supportive of all that we're doing. Thank you for coming to our last meeting as well. Thanks. So now we're back to um, the formal hearing on maintenance budget, item number five. And I invite to the table Director Tom Tussaud. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on the 2018-2019 budget. I'd like to start off with significant items that I have in the budget. The first would be a portion of the bleachers at the high school outside that would be upgraded. The second item would be at Reed's Ferry, a roofing project, roughly 20,000 square feet. The third item I'd like to bring to your attention would be a district-wide PFOA filtration system 
And the fourth item I'd like to speak with is there's a significant increase in building upkeep, upkeep and repair in this budget. Um, <clears throat> I could go, j just a question, how would you like me to uh, work this? Would you like me to go through the budget or would you like me to start taking questions that I've received already and maybe I can work that way through it? Um, if you want to work through it with Q&A, that's fine. If there's any follow-up or areas where the budget needs further clarification. Um, what I will say is anyone that um, has not seen the budget is available um, on our website. So anyone that wants more granular detail on, on the maintenance operations can, can definitely find the information there as well. Okay. Thanks. Uh, one of the first questions is from uh, Chairman Barnes. Uh, plans and interest in future budgets on cameras. And I thought I'd start off by talking about how we came up with looking at cameras. It's been approximately now 10 years since we've had cameras start into our school. Obviously, we look over the time and we look at safety, um, how our building's affected, and what we can do to improve that on a regular basis. So with the thought of last year, us introducing to the board uh, new cameras at the middle school, and we decided to split that up with five the initial year and five in this year. We actually, I actually went back and spoke with all the principals and trying to get their input and to understand their needs and their, what they would like to see and how they see security improve at their buildings. After gathering all that, knowledge, all that data with the principals, I sat down with the leadership team with Matt and we sat with Marge and we all discussed probably how we, wish we should progress. Our first thought was to finish off at the middle school, which we told the school board that we were going to start last year and this year. And we have some cameras in there from the middle school that we are putting in three cameras. The other items we decided to uh, address would be the high school um, exterior and interior. And as far as developing a future plan, I don't think we've spoken too much in about where we're going to end up with that. Uh, you do see a considerable amount of cameras sitting on our cut list at now. Uh, it was our intention that that would obviously be too much at one time to come out and uh, expect someone to support all that. So we kind of chunked it at least this year, and then we'll come back and look each year, I believe, in what we feel is the most important areas to highlight. Uh, <clears throat> the second question, I believe, from Chairman Barnes would be asking a question about sink sinks. <clears throat> in the budget, there is roughly 11 sinks in cabinetry replaced at Mastercola Elementary School. The total number of that is 22. We decided to take 11 of them and put 11 in this year's budget, and moving forward, we would expect to put 11 in next year's budget also. Moving on from there, <clears throat> we would talk about bleachers. And the question, I believe, is, is there any other big bleacher pro projects that's going to come up in the future? I would go back to the SIP as we know that there are probably two different sets of bleachers in our district that need attention. One would be at Mastercola Up Elementary School, the Smith Gym, and the other one is Mastercola Up Elementary School, the APR. <clears throat> uh, both of those are dated. They are over 40 years old. They still are in good condition, uh, but they lack serious need of uh, handrails, there's safety issues to them. Uh, so we thought when we looked at this whole thing, we started with the outdoor bleachers at the high schools in this year's budget because we think that gives us the biggest risk, something we wanted to solve right away. The reason why you would see Master Cola Upper Elementary School, the Smith Gym in, because those are probably the tallest set of bleachers that we have besides the high school and the middle school that need to be replaced. Um, 
and hopefully that sums up some of the, the thought. There's also a question in long-term item planning, which we normally do with the SIP. Uh, that would be windows would be coming up. It's been, we talked about it. I, I see that on SIP. Uh, also, we would see that uh, items such as the, well, the, the windows is one and the bleaches would be the second. So those are two items that would be coming up. And we, what we do is sit down every year. And when we sit down every year, we always see if there's anything new out there or anything that has slipped our attention. I know at some point we have some HVAC equipment to be done. Uh, that will be uh, probably present uh, brought to the board by Honeywell. And they're going to be doing a, a study of that. <clears throat> so I think that's basically how we handle that, and I hopefully that answers most of your questions. It actually did. You, you kind of brought it back because you, I know we review the CIP every year, but Honeywell definitely had a lot of things to cover when they presented to us. So when we looked at it, and especially I think HVAC was exactly what brought that question to mind, not that we don't have a CIP, but are there things not on the CIP we, that we're going to have to consider? And I think that Honeywell kind of tipped us off to that. Um, but, you know, is, is it, it kind of like started the conversation. If there are other things, you know, obviously you come to us regularly, so we don't have to solve it during budget season, but just get the conversation started and, and long term. We can absolutely, I think Honeywell gives us a lot to, a lot to chew on and uh, for long term strategy and planning as well for, for those kind of things. Um, the question I had on sync plans was actually, um, well, we need to do this sooner or later in the other district buildings. So I know that you split it up this year and uh, next year for uh, the Master Cola building. But um, I know Reed's, Thornton's, um, the middle school's probably modern enough. High school has some aging areas. Uh, so do we need to look at those type of uh, sync, like individual classroom sync issues in other buildings in the district? And is this going to be a recurring theme in our budgets going forward. The way I look at it is Master Cola Elementary School has been on my radar maybe four or five years of things that need to happen. Uh, Thorntons and Reeds are not on my radar whatsoever. I would not expect uh, within the next four or five years coming back with anything from them as far as what they have is, is working quite well. Excellent. Well, that's good news. Okay. So my <laughs> Second, second topic or second person would be uh, Andy Snyder. There's another question about. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It, uh, my other question was: In light of recent events with bats at JMU's, is there a way to screen other buildings for such issues, and what would that entail? Uh, clearly, this budget was developed before the issue presented itself. Right. I think bat 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 issues have unfortunately been with us for a long time in the district. We've always done some preventative things to stop it uh we've always we've worked with the company that's now working with us uh with our bad issues for a long time they've actually come up and they do a ceiling around the building uh would putting valves in there's a one-way valve so the bats can fly out once they're out and they've been out a good time they come back take the valves down reseal that Certainly with what is in front of us, that is absolutely a number one priority for us. Uh, unfortunately or fortunately, right now, it, it, their bats are in dormant. Uh, there's nothing you can do about removing and making sure they're out of your building at this point. But as soon as we hit spring and it is okay with the guidelines of the state, we will go back and we will go through and do everything we can to each building without, without a doubt. Cinda? Just a quick comment on the bat situation. It's, I don't want to take us too far off, but just I want to say it publicly. I mentioned it to Shannon. Uh, she and I talked about it recently, but um, I know when I think, I think it was when you were here last time we talked about, or Matt had mentioned that it wasn't covered. We didn't believe it to be covered by insurance. And one of the things that I wanted to request is a formal letter of denial or... Um, it's in the packet. It's in the packet. Oh, I missed that one. Okay, thank you. I didn't Never want mind. to wait. <laughs> Excellent. 
So, so on that note, yes, obviously I think all of our buildings look similar in construction, a lot of brick buildings, create nice cozy environments for our bat friends. And uh, on that note, just obviously if there's any strategy or tactic that we can look at to identify, you know, long term, I guess, you know, how we're going to, just like you walk the roofs, how do you walk the bats? We're going to have a thorough inspection thing. done to the exterior of all our schools. Yeah, I Excellent. think part of That's the perfect. part of what we were looking at, if I could just kind of add to that, Please is do. Tom and I were talking with uh, the co-owner of Critter Control, Jesse Frazier, and he pointed out the the flashing on the 97 edition when the roof was built in 1997. Uh, there's a the gap there that kind of acts as a garage door for bats. So we'll go around to the rest of the schools and, and take a look at the the flashing to see how tight it is and then come the warmer weather when if they're in hibernation you, you can't do anything with them now obviously bats are a protected species they're actually good for the environment mm -hmm. um, so we'll put in some uh, piping that lets them leave but not come back and after that is happens then we'll reseal but the roof for the Reeds Ferry Elementary School is on the CIP for 2019-2020, I believe. So if we would have just perchance put that one forward, we probably would have noticed the bat problem, problem when we were doing the roof because the flashing would come off and then we could see down where the brick is and the block is between the walls at that time. That'd be the uh, Master Cola roof. Yes. Correct? Master Cola, the edition correct. where the 97 edition there. Yeah, Muse, yeah. Okay. I think there's others, so. Okay, I'd like to move on, if we could, to uh, Mr. Snyder's questions. And one was in the budget logic of how I came up with the natural gas. Uh, what we actually had is we've actually had two years of um, actual expenditures 2015 and 2016 and also of 16 and 17 so we took our two years of expenditures and we took the highest amount uh, is there any risk that we're going to be really short doing that it's it's very high it's kind of like that crystal ball uh, right now i see prices stable i would think that we're going to be okay and i expect that uh, We'll be right where we are. The The real problem is if I just went off of one year, every year there's highs and lows. Um, I would expect next year that I would probably go off of three years of what what we have for that. Uh, so that, that's my question, as far, my answer as far as on how we came up with the formula for the um, natural gas. Could I, I'll just interject real quick. Since, um, <coughs> It just, you answered the question. Um, it's just there were actually a couple of oil usages too that fluctuated quite a bit. It was almost mm -hmm. like um, it wasn't the dollar amount. I know the oil prices have dropped over the last couple of years, but it just seemed like, in general, when you did oil, because you've been doing oil for a long time, mm -hmm. how many years do you usually look at? Do you like a three year average for the oil usage? Or? Normally three years, but we did two years just to be, try to be consistent. You know, with okay. this whole budget thing, uh, okay. and they've been pretty fairly in there. Okay. There's always up and down. Yeah, I know. It, and I think it's because it was the two year that it looked more dramatic this time. Because I've I've been doing mm -hmm. this long enough to know that you do multi year averages, but right. the natural gas seemed around, and and um, and because the, now for the first time you see three years in the budget, you see two expended years, one and one budgeted year that you're in the middle of, and one that you're forecasting. So. You're right. It, it, it was just kind of stuck out to me as not normal from what I usually do for the budget. So that's the reason I asked. Okay. The next item would be on line, and I'm going to read the line for you. It's on 100-264-40-8432-08. And it, the line, and it, what it is, is it's uh, maintenance upkeep. And the question is that it rose by $10,000, and that is a contractual uh, raise in our contract that we have with Honeywell. And they are actually, I believe it's 
seven dollars short of the ten thousand. So yeah, it comes out to ten thousand dollars each year that is it gets added to that line. The question, the also you followed up with a question saying that when I'm looking at 2017-18, it's nearly forty thousand dollars higher than 2016-2017, and the reason for that is that there there is a little play in that budget. Uh, there, Honeywell does cover a lot of items for us. Uh, they don't cover piping. They don't cover items like uh, in a boiler that you have sections sometimes that um, have cracks in there and they leak. Um, they don't cover uh, expansion tanks. I can tell you that year I looked back and I didn't see any items that uh, would be out of the normal, but this year, looking at my budget, uh, between expansion tanks, uh, cracked parts of boilers, I'm roughly $14,000 over the Honeywell contract. And that's what it is. It's just a play in there that we keep for that items that happen. Moving on to the next item, it's 100 2620 40 dash 8432-08. The art room, cabinets, countertops, are these, <clears throat> can these items last another year? And I would say, yes, they absolutely could. They are, some of the tops are cracked. Uh, it's not in the best condition, but could they last another year if we needed to push them out? And I would say yes. Yeah, the only reason I ask is because I don't recall these in a previous previous budget discussion or anything. So sometimes when these things come up, either they're broken and you're like, oh, crap. You know, like you said, the discussion you have. Um, so I was just trying to get a gauge as to whether these were things that, you know, are starting to show up on your radar screen, and but we've got some time to address it versus they showed up on the radar screen and we didn't realize it and we've got to really do it. So that's yeah. sort of what I was trying to get the gauge on that. Okay. Go ahead. Just since you have that item up, um, if you were given an option, and tell me if this is out of line here, but would you rather the art room cabinets or the additional cameras? That would be a tough question. That That's almost a administration question. I mean, because you're having principals deal with cameras, what they're involving kids, and then it is another principal that's in her school. So probably, uh, uh, I don't think there's a clear for sure. me. Marge? So what I'd say that would make most sense really is if the board wishes um, cuts to be made to say we want you to find 100,000, 200,000, whatever. And what happens is the administration comes back together because we put it together and we look and say what is it that we can live without and we go back and everyone does the exploratory. And we have just found over time that has been exceedingly helpful. So Tom would weigh in, but Marsha McGill would weigh in as well. And so that then just makes it reasonable because what you put together, you can take apart. And I just think, you know, if that answers your, it's kind of a roundabout answer. Yeah, for I just you. kind of thrown out there because if something yeah. could, could, if something could be pushed a year, but cameras could actually bring security. Right. I think, to be honest of, with you, it's like Tom said with cameras. With cameras, we were very deliberative about it because um, Matt and Tom did a major study, and that's why you saw all those cameras on the cut list. We literally brought in a person we've worked before that we trust, and literally they went through the district and looked at every, mm, every need over time. And then we really sat together and said, given the fact that we have so many other things that we need, just like a family does, what are the most important cameras? And the first thing, as Tom said, we told you we were going to take the middle school camera need last year, divide it in half, five plus five. So we needed to go back to that. And then we looked at the high school to say, where are the areas where there have been difficulties? Either a hallway that's not been covered or whatever, and the lower ball field. And then we said to all the other principals, you know that you've been represented because they're the cameras that are needed and where they're needed, but this year this is where we're putting our priority and all of you will be next. And then kind of just laid out 
a plan. So we literally could do a camera plan for you, but the thought was we needed to parse it out. So cameras will be in your foreseeable future, but we just didn't feel, given all the other needs that we had, that we could do more than that. Okay. The next next item I'd like to move to is uh, Mr. Thompson's. This is a, a question and I absolutely understand why this came out. Is the uh, eight, why is the eight thousand dollars overexpended on the water for the high school? That is directly related to us putting in a new track. Every layer every process we went through we had to go back and clean the track it was upon us to supply water for them to do it so it's a one-time expense and it was directly related to the construction of the track next um, then we move to Cinder and I believe she also asked about the eight thousand dollars in the for the water um, and obviously it's the track. Uh, can you tell me more about the increases uh, due to the <coughs> repair budget? Uh, basically what happens is that is a line item that gets stuff gets put into it. Um, last year there wasn't much and this year there are a few different additions. One, one item that was in that is last year we had $8,000 in for whiteboards. This year it's 15, so that would increase that by seven. Uh, you're also looking at the cameras in there. That's forty-seven thousand seven hundred dollars. The sink base is at ME. That would be a twenty-four seven, twenty-four thousand seven hundred fifty dollars. Calf tables forty-eight thousand at Mastercola Elementary School, and the art room uh, cabinets for forty-six thousand. So that's why that budget seems like that line item is so much greater than it was last year's just there's more stuff in there that needs uh, to uh, be updated um, let's see next uh, I think we go into cost the cameras and how, how we came up and do we know that we're getting a good deal uh, unfortunately with cameras when they come up and I know everybody and I do the same thing when I look at different items. <clears throat> well, I can do, I can get this, or I can get Y here. Uh, what you're seeing is camera prices, but what you don't see in here <clears throat> is that soup to nuts. I mean, that that's also wiring, installing, making sure that it works with our existing system. <clears throat> we also have a warranty uh, on all these cameras, and once they go up online. And after a year, they're going to be worked into our service agreement. And if there's an issue with the camera, they fix it. If we ended up having a camera from three different outfits, it would be almost a nightmare for us to keep it uh, clarified on what we have to do as far as maintenance and how we keep them up on a regular basis. Uh, the cameras we have are uh, commercial grade. They, they work very well. Uh, we're putting in all IP cameras now, so we make sure. Uh, it's not like 10 years ago when sometimes you look down cameras and you had a great view in front of you, but you tried to look that person down the hallway and down the hallway, okay, that's two people and you're not sure if that's Ken Johnson down there or is that Pete Bergeron. So uh, the better cameras actually just let you be able to see exactly who is down there. And that's very important for the principals because sometimes they're not only looking for who's down there, they're looking, maybe looking what's in their hand. How are they turned? Do they have a co somebody else's coat or something like that? So that's why upgraded cameras help us. And for us to keep all our cameras at the same quality, I think is important to us. Plus we're working with a vendor as, as Matt they worked with us for a long time that gives us good quality service and is very fair to us we believe yeah they also maintain all the servers because all the cameras come back to one server with the exception of uh, two cameras that are on the maintenance shed where the middle school is near the ball field up top 
the rest of them you can sit down at your well Tom can sit down at his on his laptop not laptop but his screen and bring up all the cameras live from any school in any location so they maintain that bridge for us also and they give us all the software updates they do any training that anybody needs to do it's really a, a good relationship that we've had over the years and there's the initial uh, vendor that was chosen when we did <coughs> shop this around uh, to put the cameras in when we had two hundred twenty thousand dollars in the budget probably ten years ago mm -hmm. I think it was to start it off uh, with uh, an effort at the high school interior exterior cameras and exterior cameras that I believe at all the other facilities so that's how it all began but that was analog back then so now it's now it's changed technology we've had very good luck with uh, not luck but a very good re re working relationship with this uh, particular company Cinda yes. so, so I just wonder how we know we're getting the competitive price I think it's great we have a good relationship with them and they won um, you know the RFP that we went to 10 years ago and I think there's a lot of value in those cameras and I totally get you're talking a, a large infrastructure mm -hmm. to support it where you're talking high resolution you probably can see nighttime <coughs> type things as well as but it's you know really my question and you don't have to answer that now I mean I'm just yeah. it's just food for thought mm -hmm. is how do we know that that we're still getting a competitive price and I think it's like I said the having a good relationship with our vendor is really solid but I think we still need I have to just really say that because I know it's a large <coughs> expenditure for the district I just want to make sure we're getting a, a bang for our buck okay. yeah. thank you are there any other questions of maintenance seeing none you made Dave Zeke proud saying the bar very high good thorough answers and uh, we appreciate your work on the on the preparation and what you do for the district all year long to to keep us going. Thank you. So, um, housekeeping though, because I do this every time. It's item number six. So I'm about on time. Um, student Rep Puzzo is excused from tonight's meeting. Um, it's a little icy out there, and young drivers definitely taking uh, not taking the high risk decision. I love it. So, so we just came off of earlier. So perfect. Um, so we will go into item number six, which is the second update on the remediation of bat residue at James Mastercola Upper Elementary School with Matt. Um, thank you. Um, last time I reported that we had uh, evacuated class classrooms 110, 111, 112, 113, 210, 211, 212, and 213 in the music room. And we had found uh, one of the rooms, room 110, to have cryptococcus and spores in it. Uh, we had done a, another sampling of rooms 112, 121, 111, 113, 117, 211, a lot of rooms, I'm not gonna list them uh, all off. Um, the hallway in the lower level or, or, or even outside the building is a control sample. <clears throat> and we found uh, some more spores in 113, which can be a result of the remediation process and everything being moved around and, and taken apart. Right now, we're at a spot where all the brickwork on the three sides of the affected area has been removed by complete masonry. Scott Isabel, uh, Mike Isabel is the uh, owner of that company. And he made a point to say that he went to Reed's Ferry School back in the day, so it was kind of kind of nice to have him reminisce about uh, his days back then. But <clears throat> all the brickwork has been taken out. Uh, Critter Control Jesse Frazier is working right now on removing all the leftover residue that's there uh, using HEPA filter vacuums. After that's done, everything's going to be washed down. After that's done, everything's going to be sealed and painted, the block itself, and with an antifungal paint. Um, the next step would be to put new insulation. That's going to be done by the masonry contractor. At that point in time, we'll probably do another air inspection to just do a checkup along the way. 
and then the brickwork will begin. The bricks probably won't be on site until the first part of January because they're being manufactured right now. And at that point in time, we'll begin the uh, brickwork and hope to complete perhaps by the end of January, perhaps spilling into February. But once everything is complete and everything is sealed off, then we want to do one last air quality test of all the areas and see if we want to expand it further into the school just to make sure. And that's usually a week turnaround. So we could be in the first part of February until we get the test results back and then we get the all clear and, every, and everybody can go back into the classroom. So I already see some hands. Michael? So just to uh, clarify for the audience also, the, the test that came back positive was not for the fungal that actually causes health issues, correct? The histoplas, yes, the histoplasma, I've seen. So, so the that, histoplasma was not found within no, the school? No, that is correct. Thank you. I just want to clarify that for everybody that's I've heard that watching. term being used and being stated in various venues, and that's not the case. It's not true. And then the follow-up question would be, is do we have an estimate of cost yet, or are you going to get into that? We have an estimate of what the total cost would be. Um, it would uh, be approximately um, from the beginning with the testing to the brickwork to the removal to the reconstruction um, in the uh, $600,000 range. That took a moment. Um, yeah. So on that note, we maintain buildings. We do what's needed to be done. Um, my question sounds a little shallow right now, which is based on our, our bleacher gate and shading and coloring, knowing we're bringing in bricks that are going to be put up into their new bricks because they're being manufactured, mm -hmm. how are they going to match the existing structure? Oh, yeah, they're going to match the exist existing structure uh, perfectly. Okay. I've seen samples. Okay. And the reason why, you know, somebody could say, well, can't you save money by reusing the old bricks? The answer is no. Okay. You can't clean them. You can't chip the grout off of them. It's just, they're going in the dumpster, and they're leaving for parts unknown. So okay. they're just gone. So the new bricks are being made. They will match, and I've seen samples. They'll match the facade perfectly. Okay. Andy? So knowing that based on what you've provided and what we've talked about, that insurance doesn't cover this, mm -hmm. and knowing that the emergency fund that we have that we thought we kept seeding very generously is, is going to fall at least halfway short of what this is, do you have an idea of the approach that you would recommend the district take to cover this, depending on what the, the final value is? Well... I have been working with the state of New Hampshire. They have visited us on a couple of occasions. Marjorie Schoonemaker, um, the head of uh, school approval, and Amy Clark, who's an engineer with the Department of Ed, visited us. And <clears throat> there is some monies available uh, at the state level to reimburse us for this cost. And I don't want to get anybody's hopes up high or even say what the percentage would be. And it wouldn't cover the entire amount. That's be clear on that. But um, an application has been filed. Cinda? So assuming zero funding from the state, let's just not get our hopes up, what are our options for funding it without it being planned for or budgeted for? And without enough money in the reserve fund, what are our options? Well, some of the options are to look at Tom's budget, what he has um, in his uh, general maintenance lines to see what we could perhaps defer and then to look a little bit harder at the savings that we had for health insurance and the savings we had for retirees that we could possibly pull together 
the rest of what's needed. Um, at this point in time, <clears throat> I think that's a very good possibility without going over the bottom line and going for a deficit appropriation. Uh, but uh, that's the plan so far. And as a follow-up to that, what would be the appropriate timing um, for the school board to make any decisions that we might need to make? Well, if you want to use the uh, fund, um, any time would be a good time. Mm -hmm. I'll wait for the superintendent yep, to board. mention something. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll know something um, from the Department of Ed, which Matt has been talking about, and um, the commissioner even referred um, to our application. So I'm hopeful that we might know something by the end of January. Um, so I would say end of January, February. Um, and we really wanted to come to you um, with that news, if we could have that. And so we're just um, sitting in wait because we have put our application in and um, we're hopeful given the fact that when the Department of Ed persons came to see it, um, see the situation, they said this is exactly the kind of project that we're talking about, which was unanticipated. In other words, if you have an aging boiler, that's something that you should be taking care of and not going to this particular infrastructure fund. But this is was something extraordinary, um, unanticipated. And so we are very hopeful, but we just have to wait on to hear outcome. And then another follow-up question, which would be, um, does it make sense you know, to maybe bring it to the attention of some of our state legislator, legislator, legislators um, for any additional support that we might need with the state? Um, I would say, and I th think, Cinda, um, I can understand why you're going in that direction. This particular, um, and maybe they could work it, the fund is actually um, put together um, by the governor. It was um, $19 million that was in surplus from the end of last year, and it's not really a building aid fund. It's broken up into three parts. Um, one has to do with um, extending broadband opportunities for um, areas in the North Country especially. Second has to do with life security, and third has to do with just um, general, or life safety and general um, security. And so um, we have gone forward with the life safety with the hope that this would meet that. So um, I think the commissioner and the governor and then there is a person from Homeland Security, I think it might be Perry Plummer himself and some other persons that sit on um, this committee to make those decisions. Um, so the thing that makes me hopeful is that the commissioner spoke to me about the bad situation and so he's very cognizant of it. And so rather than do a lot of pressure, I'm just hopeful it will happen. Um, but it's being monitored as I speak. There was one statement that was made by the State of New Hampshire Department of Ed when they did come down to visit us that <clears throat> in addition to what the superintendent just said is, you know, this really kind of meets the, the spirit of, of what this category of monies is for. Uh, secondly, and most importantly, it was stated to me by both who were in my company from the DOE that there was absolutely nothing you could have done or foreseen to avoid this situation. It is totally something unexpected and not a lack of, of maintenance or anything like that and just something that just happened and you, there's no way you could have avoided this. <coughs> It just is. So that goes in our favor also, that we weren't remiss in anything as far as our maintenance plan or anything to do with our facilities, which you know we keep in tip-top condition. <coughs> so are there any other questions? Um, bats. As you know, they are my favorite. Um, so we will go on to item number seven, which is the approval of the December 4th, 2017 minutes. Do I have a motion to approve? Uh, Cinda, do I have a second? Michael, any edits to the minutes? Seeing none, we'll put the motion to a vote. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. 
Opposed, none. The motion carries, 500. Um, item number eight, consent agenda, and I turn it over to Mark. I have one item on consent tonight. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <coughs> pardon me. Gregory Butler, science teacher at Merrimack High School. Is there a motion? Andy. I move we accept the consent agenda as read. Is there a second? Seconded by Naomi. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, none. The motion carries 5 0 0. On to item number nine, which is the acceptance of gifts and grants under $5,000 with Matt. Thank you. Uh, we have a gift to Thornton's Ferry Elementary School from <coughs> Barnes and Noble, uh, 435 DW Highway, Nashua, New Hampshire, in the amount of $188.72. Uh, the money is to be deposited into one of their budget accounts that are reading text to be purchased by the TFS librarian. Um, this is part of the ongoing um, efforts that the staff make to do a reading, principal's reading night book and performance at Barnes and Noble and it raises uh, funds. So I wish sometimes they'd tape some of these performances because I remember when John Fabrizio was a elementary school principal, I believe. He dressed up as the cat in the hat at one point at full regalia. So it's kind of kind of nice thing that the principals do to get money for their schools. And we appreciate them, and we appreciate Barnes & Noble. Thank you. Sounds great. Is there a motion? Cinda? I move that we accept the gift from Burns and Noble to Thornton Square Elementary School in the amount of $188.72 with our gratitude. Is there a second? Seconded by Michael. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed none. The motion carries 500. I move that John Fabrizio does his budget in the full cat in the hat regalia. Do I have a second? <laughs> no pressure, John, but we wouldn't mind either. Um, so on, on to item number 10, which is other. Is there any correspondence to come before the board? I had one. I had a parent reach out, which I shared with the administration, having questions on uh, the homework protocol and how teachers are applying, how the protocol is um, being rolled out in the classroom. So that was shared with the administration to use this, um, some, some case study. And I think it's you know, very good, and that's very appreciated feedback from, from parents. Um, so is there any other correspondence from the board? Seeing none, are there any comments from the board? And Marge. I would just ask if you have questions to submit for the other parts of the budget. I think we said that December 19th would be um, the day because next week we're going to have people gone. And so that would be very helpful. From Paige. <laughs> thank you. Excellent. I know some have come in already, yes, so thank you. you. Okay. So any new business to come before the board? Item number 11. Seeing none. Um, I'm just going to rattle off the new business that we do have coming up. So, <coughs> excuse me, our next board meeting is January 2nd here in Town Hall. Um, it's in the memorial room, which is not the room we're normally in. It's a room across the way near the town, man uh, yeah, town manager's office. And that will be at 7 p.m. And we will have the board budget hearing for the three elementary schools, the middle school, the high school, and the district-wide budget. And then, I'm sorry, correction. James Master Call Upper Elementary School, Technology, Library, Media, and Special Services will be that night. Uh, Thursday, January 4th at Town Hall, again in the Memorial Room, which is the same uh, across the way outside the Town Manager's Office at 7 p.m. And then we will be going over Master Call Elementary, Reeds Ferry, Thornton's Ferry, the Middle School, the High School, the District-wide Budget. And then Tuesday, January 9th, um, we will be meeting actually here at 7 p.m. and we will have our board budget hearing and uh, we will go over warrant articles and any other uh, further discussion required based on dialogue in uh, budget hearings. So uh, we do have a lot of new business coming up, which has um, you know, been communicated. We just want to make sure that you're getting those touch points in the community. And any questions that you have of us, this is a great opportunity to, uh, to ask us or, or share your feedback. And again, our budget is on our website. Um, on to item number 12, committee reports. Are there any committee reports? I see Naomi and Cinda and Andy. So we'll start with Naomi. 
the kindergarten task force has met again and continues to work on gathering more information to bring before the board, and I believe they'll do so in an upcoming meeting. Thank you very much. Cinda? Um, I had a uh, Merrimack safeguard meeting a couple weeks ago, and a big part of the meeting was um, discussing the YRBS survey results um, in particular. So, Excellent. Andy? So I stacked two meetings on the same day on the 11th of December. We first had wellness committee meeting um, where they went over uh, the different um, things that are going on in the different schools, talked about um, ongoing newsletters and some um, also um, ways they wanted to spend some funds that they were going to receive. So it was mostly just an information. They're, they are meeting more frequently now, trying to get much more um, integrated wellness into the schools than before. Um, and they also talked a little bit about the... Uh, the tick event that happened, Lyme uh, the Lyme, Lyme disease, disease, thank yeah. you, the Lyme disease, well, ticks are involved with Lyme disease um, that much. occurred. Um, <clears throat> so that happened on the 11th, and then later the day on the 11th was a Ceresk Board of Directors meeting where um, um, we were able to hear some uh, input from Ceresk as to how they want to um, move forward, uh, just as those folks know, as folks know, the, um, the Ceresk uh, Event Center um, was sold, and Ceresk is now residing in a small um, office building that's near, closer to where the Macy's used to be. Bethany Commons. Yeah, Bethany Commons. Is, but it's on uh, South River Road, not too far from Carabas. Um, but that's where they, they're they at now, so they're no longer, as of the end of the year, in the, um, in the event business. Uh, they're um, now focusing back in on their core, core values and their core function as uh, providing services to um, the school districts. Um, they're in the middle of looking at how they want to reform starting in uh, 2018. Um, so the, the membership of the board of directors is meeting and talking about how they want to evolve the program and see it on going forward. So um, more to come on that as we go through the coming months. But uh, that's where we're on that. Thank you. Um, I had the Healthcare Cost Containment Committee. Uh, so we met at the beginning of the month. We went over... Um, we have goals every year for um, for screenings uh, to get a percentage of our staff screened for um, biometrics. So we had a goal of 58 percent, and we are at 58 percent. So we, you know, are looking to maintain that. We have a stretch goal of 60 percent, and that could still be technically achieved by end of the year. And uh, we also were going over the preparations for next month's wellness fair, and so. That will kick off the um, biometric screening season, I think, in a very large way. And over half the slots have already been reserved for those screenings. A lot of um, community wellness organizations um, that are tethered to it, uh, things like uh, Fleet Feet um, for running shoes. So a number of area businesses like Fit Lab. Um, I know that Plant Fitness is coming into town, so that's one that we can definitely leverage as well in the future. But with all of those um, organizations, just having an outreach about the services they can provide to staff and that um, they can take advantage of not far from where they work every day. So um, we are signing up those event, those uh, partners now and look forward to a great event next month. And a lot of hard work is being put in by the um, the committee that, uh, subcommittee technically, that, that works on that event. So they're doing great work. Um, are there any other committee reports? Okay. So going on to public comments on agenda items, and the room is empty now, so we are going to skip that. We will sign the manifest and take a motion. I will accept a motion to go to non-public session per RSA 91-A colon 3, Roman numeral 2, sections C and E. So moved. Made by Michael, seconded by Andy. Naomi, how do you vote? In favor. Michael? In favor. Cinda? In favor. Andy? In favor. And I also vote in favor. The motion carries 5-0-0. Thank you, and good night.